Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at Massey University in Palmerston North, New Zealand, and we're going to be talking about veterinary sciences. And I'm here with the Dean of Veterinary Sciences, Jenny Weston. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks, Steve. It's lovely to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Jenny, if you could say a word or two about veterinary sciences here at Massey, and why would an American student come to Massey to study, or to New Zealand in general, to study veterinary sciences? Um, our veterinary program is a five-year program in total, and you don't need an undergraduate degree before you apply to enter the program. Um, we are well recognised internationally for the quality of our veterinary graduates um, and very high employability, so very practical, ready to hit the ground running um, once they graduate, and our graduates are recognised all around the world. So North America, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. So you can come and train at Massey and then go straight back to working in the States. Well, you mentioned hit the ground running. Uh, what would I be running to? What would be some of the jobs that I would get if I studied at your school? So pretty much everyone who wants to become a veterinarian thinks they want to do clinical practice and most people would work for a couple of years in clinical practice and then often people do end up moving to other careers still within the veterinary sphere, whether it's in research, teaching, um, pharmaceutical companies, animal welfare organisations, lots of different things. But we have a strong focus on a broad program with as much emphasis on our farm animals as companion animals. So that's very important here in New Zealand for our agricultural economy. But um, yeah, so well equipped to start working with any species of animal. And, and But certainly species are different from place to place. Yes, um, so the degree is very much focused on the New Zealand scene. Um, but quite a lot of our, even our New Zealand students sit the NAVLI exam for licensing in North America. Um, and so um, they study also for the important exotic diseases that we don't have in New Zealand that you might have elsewhere. Such as? Oh, lots that we don't have, thank goodness. Things like rabies, um, brucellosis, uh, a lot of, lot of other things that New Zealand is protected from by being a small country in the middle of a big ocean. What courses would I need to take if I were going to, going to be a student here? So most of our students from New Zealand come here and go straight to veterinary school rather than doing a degree first. Um, and the selection process is around one semester of science subjects. So if you've got a good background in the sciences, um, then that will help you compete to get in. Uh, we take some international students who have done a couple of years or more of university before. So again, uh, an emphasis on the science subjects is, is helpful. Right, and that I guess suppose is a big difference between the New Zealand system and the American system. Yes, well the big, the big difference being that we're an undergraduate veterinary program, um, that you don't need to already have a college degree. So um, that means a lot less years of training and a lot less student debt and you're starting work a lot sooner. Well that's a fair point because we've had a problem as you probably know in the United States with tremendous student debt issues. Mm. Uh, so can you walk us through some what some American students who have come through Massey have done in terms of their coursework and then perhaps their jobs afterwards? Um, so most of them are coming as what we would call group one students so they come here straight away and do the full five years and then it doesn't really matter what they've done beforehand. Um, we don't have a requirement for thousands of hours of practical work and experience. Um, we only require that people have done up to two weeks of um, working in veterinary clinics to get exposure to what the job's all about. Other people who have done uh, under, a graduate degree in the States come, um, and that just means that they, it takes a lot, to, lot longer before they end up working. We're continuing our discussion with Brett Gartrell, who's a specialist in wildlife. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. Well, maybe, Brett, if you could say a word or two, you're a specialist within a specialist. My understanding is that people in the vet school come to you to do kind of emergency surgeries. That's right. Um, we work with wildlife species in New Zealand, and many of your viewers might be wondering why that's a specialty at, at Massey University. And what we need to understand is that New Zealand's fauna, the wildlife that we have in New Zealand, is critically endangered in a much worse state than just about anywhere else in the world except for possibly Hawaii. We've lost lots of species and those that are left are often down to a couple of hundred. So we provide veterinary services to those critically endangered species within the vet school in New Zealand. 
And why is, there, why is this happening? Why, why are there more endangered species here than other places? Well, New Zealand's right at the bottom end of the world and it was one of the last countries colonised. And because of that, its fauna actually developed quite separately to uh, uh, the rest of the world. And it was predominated by birds. There wasn't many mammal predators at all, but when people came, we brought in dogs, we brought in cats, we brought in rats, stoats, ferrets, weasels, and they have devastated the, the wildlife here. So those, those wildlife species that exist are heavily managed now, those native wildlife species that are left. So we heavily manage them, and as part of that, they often find them with broken wings, with injury or illnesses. And so there's an opportunity to p apply veterinary science to the conservation of these critically endangered species and make a difference in whether or not they continue to exist in our world. Well, that's quite important. Um, so do you have some students helping you with some of these emergency projects? Yes, it's not just me. It's a whole team of veterinarians and veterinary nurses and technologists that are involved. And we have postgraduate students and undergrads working with us within both our hospital service, within the post-mortem work that we do, and on the research projects that we do as well. So my understanding is that pollution is also a, a problem, uh, not just here, but around the world. How does that affect the wildlife as well? Well, similar to the US, we see lots of problems with pollution. We have uh, lots of plastics in the seabirds that come in, and we, we've recently had a giant petrel come in that swallowed a a plastic teaspoon and a balloon and some other little bits of plastic. But we also see heavy metal poisoning with lead, cadmium and copper in our wildlife as well. Some of that is from ammunition, but other is it from other sources, industrial sources, the fertilizers, even the food supplements that we're using on our dairy cows are moving through and affecting the wildlife species sometimes. So there's a range of, of things that can go wrong that we cause that are further damaging our wildlife species. So a lot of our research is about trying to take the individual cases that we see through the hospital or the post-mortem service and actually dig back deeper into the wild population and see what's going on and see if we can do anything to address it. Well, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but as you're saying that, I was thinking of the irony of, you know, the more advances we have, that you're a special doctor within a special doctor within a special doctor, but our advances have also caused some of the problems that got us here in the first place. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the beauty of what we do is being able to uh, apply all that special technology that we've learned to actually try and clear up some of the mess that we've made. So we are in a bit of a, a, a loop, if you like, with that. Well, and, and so, and how do students get involved in kind of closing that loop a little bit? Well, at the undergraduate level, we're um, there to, to teach them how to handle wildlife safety and take diagnostic samples and expose them to some of the issues that are, that are involved. At the postgraduate level, they may be involved in a clinical residency training where they're actually working directly with the endangered species and doing surgery and medicine and those kind of things. Or they may be involved in a research capacity where they're actually going out and investigating some of these problems in fine detail and trying to bring, bring back some ideas about how we can address these issues in general. And in terms of the issues, are there different ways that different countries are approaching these issues? Oh yeah, oh, this is a highly political situation. Um, so every country has a different approach and one of the great things about my group is that we have international students from all over the world coming together to look at these problems. And while we look at them often in just the New Zealand context, those, the students then take those lessons that they've learned back to their home countries and try and apply them there. So whether it's lead poisoning in New Zealand or lead poisoning in California, the same issues are at stake here and the, and the lessons that we learn can be applied all across the world. And politically, how would uh, a Californian versus somebody from New Zealand look at lead poisoning differently? It would mainly be, oh, in biological terms, it's the species that's involved. In political terms, it's trying to influence change at the higher levels, and that's what's very, very difficult to teach. We fundamentally rely on actually developing the scientific basis for understanding. And if we have that understanding, we hope, perhaps naively, that we can influence policy and if you could speak directly to the powers that be throughout the world right now, <laughs> what, what, what would you like them to do? Oh, if, the, if I was in charge of the world, it'd be a very different place. <laughs> but what I, would, I think the major, major challenges ahead is global warming. We're going to see changes in climate that are going to severely impact species all across the globe. So that's the number one challenge for our generation. 
but the pollution that we, we are continuing to pour in the environment is a big challenge. And the plastics, for instance, that we put into the seas and into the marine environment won't just be there for 10 or 20 years, they'll be there for hundreds of years and affecting wildlife and accumulating more as we go. So we have to be more sustainable about how we live on this earth and that's the message that I would like to get across. Well, thank you very much for the message and thank you for your good work. Mm, thank you. Thank you. All right, cheers. We continue our important discussion about veterinary sciences. I'm here with Eloise and Corey. Welcome. Thanks. Hi. Well, if I may say a word or two about both of them, uh, Eloise uh, is one of the deans here at Massey University and Corey is from the state of Florida and somehow made his way to, uh, to Massey University in New Zealand. So welcome again to both of you. Corey, um, why did you come all the way from Florida to New Zealand to study veterinary sciences? Yeah, well, actually it was quite a, a long story, but um, the short summary of it was that in um, a few years ago I met Eloise at one of the APVMA pre-vet symposiums and she actually came and advertised for Massey and, and tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you be interested in coming to, to New Zealand to Massey? And, and I replied with, where was New Zealand? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was quickly educated on where that was. but. The, the main draw for me was the multi-accreditation that they had. So with this degree, I can I pretty much guaranteed to have a job anywhere in the world should I decide to pick up my bags and move, move somewhere else again. And is that true, Eloise? Yeah, so it's actually really well accredited. So it's accredited for the US and Canada, for Australasia, um, for the UK. So it doesn't mean that they kind of have a lot of opportunities once they actually finish vet school. Um, and that's actually why, one of the reasons why I came here too, because I actually grew up in Canada. And so I came here to go to vet school as well too, and didn't go home. And so, so can you walk us through, since you deal with a lot of international students, can you walk us through what some of the students need to do before they get here? Absolutely. So I guess the key thing, because of the accreditation, it does mean that they can go back and work just as if they'd graduated any U.S. school. Um, but we have a different system in New Zealand. So where professional education in the U.S. is a post-grad uh, qualification, in New Zealand all our professional education programs are actually undergraduate. So medicine, law, dentistry, vet school. So it means that our students actually go into those programs out of high school. Um, so given that, basically we think of what we call, in the US we call a degree a doctor of veterinary medicine. Here we actually call it a bachelor of veterinary science because veterinarians are scientists at the core. So when I'm talking to students in the US, the big thing is they just need, they need to have a science and maths background. Um, I think a lot of people sometimes get confused sometimes that if I love animals enough, I'm gonna be a great veterinarian but it's really about being a great scientist in the veterinary field and things. So lots of math, lots of science is kind of the best background they can do. Well, what about a high school student who isn't, doesn't know what he or she wants to do and a high school student who took the required science classes, took the required social studies classes? How, how do they fare here? Yeah, so what I generally say is that school students start a year earlier here. So what we do in our last year of school is often what students would do in their first year of college um, back in the States. And so I would generally say to people if they've done a standard high school um, education, so not AP or IB or something like that, then they should probably go take at least a semester of college classes, um, even if it's at their local community comm, and do science and maths and things so that they can come here and be prepared. Because there is... Um, it's a very different model from the US. So you don't apply to vet school and you're in. You actually come here, you take a semester, and then based on your performance in that semester, you get to be selected into the professional phase or not selected. So basically the more prep that people can do before they actually come to that semester is what I would advise. So they're in their best place to be successful. Well, fair enough. Not mm. to put Corey in a third person here, but you're mm. saying that you recruited him to come here and then had he not succeeded mm. in the first semester, you would have sent him home? So it's the very different ways of it. So we do, um, if they don't get in after that first semester, then they can take additional classes and reapply again the next year. So we wouldn't say, you must leave, Corey. Um, but um, there is an opportunity that they would take more classes to either increase their GPA or what have you, and then reapply again the following year. So in the last few years, um, the because it is quite a big commitment. It's a big commitment to move across the world when you're not guaranteed to be continuing vet school. So it really takes kind of the right kind of person to be able to do that. Um, and so it isn't like there's a million people competing for the places, you know. So roughly last few years, it's probably been about hmm, maybe like one and a half applicants for every international place in that semester and things. So it's, it's not quite as cutthroat as it sounds, but yeah, there's definitely some disappointed um, disappointed students at the end of that semester each year. 
And Corey, you're not one of those disappointed students. Um, I'm actually a combination of the both, so I actually didn't get in the first time. Um, but I stayed and finished up another degree through Massey and got a job in New Zealand when I kind of fell in love with the country and then decided to reapply again um, after I'd finished my other degree and managed to get in the second time around. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. Would, could, would you mind sharing what that other degree was? Yeah, sure. So um, I first finished up with a Diploma of Science and Technology through Massey and then um, surrendered that towards a, another Bachelor of Science. So I have a Bachelor of Science in Animal Biology. Um, with a focus in agriculture because um, New Zealand has quite a big agriculture focus mm -hmm. and my first employment job was within the dairy sector in New Zealand. So that was kind of setting me up for, for that role and then decided to come back and try for vet school again when I just couldn't get out of the mindset of wanting to be a vet. Mm -hmm. And when you were, if you can think back to when you were a kid back in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, did you imagine that you would be in New Zealand or doing anything like this? Absolutely not. Actually, my family, we all sat down and did one of those time capsules um, quite a few years before I actually came here. And no, I planned on being living in North Carolina in a nice cottage somewhere, but as a veterinarian, but not necessarily in the means that I've, I've come about this time. <laughs> and in terms of understanding veterinary sciences from an American perspective and a New Zealand perspective, uh, given your Florida background, it might be interesting. Do you see differences? Absolutely, yeah. The the probably the biggest difference is um, what we would term here in New Zealand as exotic diseases were very normal diseases that I saw in the U.S. So I worked as a small animal veterinary technician before coming over while I was going through my undergraduate degree at the University of Florida. Um, and yeah, the things that I saw regularly were actually quite exotic. You know what you'd classify as exotic here. So that was a big difference. But luckily, it gave me actually quite a good basis and background for mm -hmm. um, the exotic diseases that maybe Kiwi students would never actually encounter in a day-to-day -day activities. And what would be an example of an exotic disease? Uh, rabies is probably the, the biggest mm -hmm. one. So New Zealand is rabies-free. Um, and that was something that we obviously had to deal with uh, in, in Florida. Lyme disease is another mm -hmm. one that was also a, a big one that we saw in Florida that just doesn't really exist here. Well, you raise an interesting issue about the diseases. Mm. So, but how would I study animal diseases and human diseases? Is there such a thing? Um, there's an increasing trend that they call One Health, and it's basically the interaction of animal and human disease, and how we talk about human diseases and we talk about animal diseases, but actually sometimes they're one and the same. They just affect you know, both humans and animals. Um, and they often use a term called zoonotic diseases for something that can be passed between animals and humans. So you will find that actually, um, so in our uh, epidemiology center here, you know, one of the leading researchers is not a veterinarian and things, but it's that interaction of um, organisms, the way they interact with animals and humans and things that is actually super interesting. And one of our kind of main centers here um, that we have like the equivalent of the World Health Organization for animals is the OIE. And so we have one of the OIE centers um, and we have the epidemiology center here because it's just that, yeah, that interaction of diseases between humans and animals. Um, and so while I would not treat a human and a human will not treat an animal, uh, like a human doctor won't treat an animal, um, there is a lot of overlap in things. The physiology is largely the same. The anatomy is very different, you know, but there's a lot of overlap. And do you study some of that in classes here? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, not just male-female differences, mm -hmm. but every species is unique, actually, in the way that it deals with it. So the whole concept of pharmacokinetics is actually, and how drugs are processed within different mm -hmm. animals is, is different between every species, and also within different life stages of the species. So it's something that, um, again, it goes back, I guess, to what Eloise said about being that scientist base, is that we really have to, you know, kind of consider that, and that is something that's absolutely mm -hmm. incorporated into the curriculum. Well, this is interesting because I, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about the evolution of species, right? And so just because a drug works today doesn't, doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to work tomorrow. Is that so? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, antimicrobial yeah. resistance would be the, the primary example. We've had old antibiotics that have been around for years and years that now aren't working, um, which puts us in kind of scary times. But it's and it goes back to this one health concept where veterinarians have actually become very involved with the human profession as well in order to start working to figure out how we can, one, protect what we have, but also, two, to see if there's new opportunities out there. And what about something like malaria? So my understanding is that malaria is not a problem in New Zealand, just like it's not a problem in the United States, but it is in other parts of the world. Uh, what happens all of a sudden if malaria does become a problem here? 
Yeah, and so basically the big difference is that we don't have the vector here. So, um, and why they do, and why they don't have it in the US, and why they do have it in some countries, because they have the particular vector or the particular mosquito that carries it. So if we did have that vector here, then it would be a possibility for us to be able to have malaria here. Um, and then it would just be a whole change in the, you know, the medical approach to it and things like that. So right now we don't think about it, but if the vector was here, then they would bring in um, protocols and things from it that they would have in other countries. So. And what about global warming? Because that's obviously a key issue around the world, but I assume that that affects life particularly around here. Well, definitely, because our production systems are more pastoral based, so we don't tend to do intensive feedlots or housing of cattle and things like that, so they tend to be out on pasture. So obviously anything that's going to affect like the environment, pastoral growth and things like that has the potential to affect our production species. Um, I wouldn't say that we've had too much issues thus far, but it's certainly something that as we go along, it's, it's certainly something that absolutely needs to be thought about in regards to our pastoral species. And what about when you get off a plane in certain countries? One of the questions they always ask is, have you uh, touched or dealt with livestock? Mm -hmm. Why are they asking that? Exactly what we were saying before for zoonotic diseases, you know, because there's different agents that can be carried um, via humans and things too. And I mean, there's a particular disease called foot and mouth disease. So it's not usually a human vector thing, but if that was to come into this country, it would decimate our production systems and things. It would have a huge economic impact. And so those are the kind of questions they're asking to be aware of, you know, is there any chance that you could have, you know, your running shoes or your gum boots from a farm could have anything on it that could um, be novel to that country. And that's where people, where countries are always kind of worried. It's a big biosecurity risk. And it's where veterinarians actually have a huge role is in biosecurity. Um, so in New Zealand, one of the biggest employers of veterinarians is actually the government, and because there's a lot of veterinarians employed in like safe food production and then biosecurity. Because like Corey was alluding to, there's a whole bunch of diseases we don't have and we're really keen to keep it that way. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. so let's assume I went on a farm somewhere mm -hmm. and I was wearing some shoes. What are you asking me to do? You're asking me to wash the shoes before I get on the plane? Yeah, yeah I, and I get this, obviously being um, a veterinary student or a veterinarian, every time you travel you have to tick that yes box on the declaration form, which is slightly terrifying because <laughs> then you're always escorted to the side and, and they kind of go through everything. Generally they expect you to decontaminate um, your shoes. Camping equipment is another big one mm. if you've been out and involved with any wildlife on that side. And then generally the customs guys check to make sure that it's clean enough. I have had a couple of shoes that they've deemed not clean enough, so they take them away and steam clean them, or sometimes they just throw them away. So um, bring an extra pair of shoes that yeah. you didn't wear on the farm. <laughs> That's really interesting. So, so, so did you know that before you left Florida to mm -hmm. come here? Um, well, luckily I didn't bring a whole lot with me when I came here, uh, but going home now is a, is a little bit different. So obviously with the curriculum we're dealing with animals, um, especially in the final year we're dealing with animals every day, and there's probably not too many days that I'm not out on a farm. So yeah, it's, um, I just be selective on what I take back with me. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the first four years of the curriculum are primarily um, lecture based. But we actually, the nice thing that I've really enjoyed about this degree is, is that even in the very first year, we already start animal handling. We're learning how to touch animals, how to hold them, how to restrain them properly, and then just getting to know what the farming systems are like. Then the unique aspect of the Massey program is too is when we get into the final year of vet school, which is the fifth and final year, um, it's all practical based. So I get opportunities to be in the Massey clinics. Um, they've got um, small animal, equine, large animal, um, and also the wild-based program as well. So we get an opportunity to see within each one of these clinics and work with the clinicians. But then we also get posted all across the country to see um, private practice and corporate practice and really get a good understanding of the industry, but also mm -hmm. Veterinary sciences, um, I like to call it a, a cookbook, you know, there's a basic recipe and people like to add and subtract things along the way. Um, and each veterinarian has their own way to approach things. So the big thing that I think these guys are trying to achieve out of the final year is to, to see that there's multiple ways to do things and there's multiple right ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the big point, which is quite, quite fun in the final year. Do you agree with that final point? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, any university's responsibility to kind of teach the gold standard, you know. So, but the reality is, is not every clinical practice is going to have the same kind of equipment that we have in a university. And so it's really important for them to see how does your everyday kind of GP veterinarian handle things. So where we may do something in a certain way here with specialist anesthetists, specialist surgeons, you know, and specialists rotating through every position, and a lot of clinics. Um, 
instead of having a specialist veterinary anesthetist, they'll have a well-qualified vet nurse you know, who will run the anesthesia and things. And I think it's really important for the students to actually see the breadth of veterinary practice um, because not every clinic runs exactly like a university does. And so that's where we have partner practices that the students are placed in so they get a really good experience of seeing um, seeing uh, private practice but still under the guise of uh, university education and things. So we work with those private practices. They come in every year to an education conference where we talk about the way that they're teaching our students and make sure that we're all kind of working off the same page. But then they're still teach them, like Corey's alluded to, those differences in the way that they practice and things like that. So, and it's really like veterinary practice has gotten so different now. You have your sort of you know, your single vet who's on all the time, sort of these, you know, huge corporate practices now that they own thousands. So um, in the US, there's, you know, corporate practices that will have thousands of clinics across the country and things. So there's really big variations in the way clinical practice works these days. And we need to make sure that the students are well prepared for that um, for when they actually get out there. If you would like additional information about the vet school at Massey University, please visit their website at massey.ac.nz. If you would like to send a message to us directly at our viewer mailbox, please do so at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.